Thank you all for being here. I do know it's early. I'm very impressed. A lot of you got coffee. Uh, so before I start, I'd just like to get a feel for who's here. Uh, so I know a little bit about who I'm talking about. So a couple of questions. Just raise your hand. How many of you are from out of the Middle East region? Hard to see up here. Okay, fair number. How many of you are from the UAE? Wow, that about takes care of it. Who's from somewhere else? Okay, great. How many of you are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs? All right, you're in the right room. Well done. Okay, how many of you are looking for money for your first deal? Well, so we got some veterans in here, that's good. How many of you are looking for money for your second deal? Third deal? You're not sure? <laughs> Does that mean the first ones didn't work? No. <laughs> good. All right, well, I'm going to talk to you today very briefly with some opening comments about angel financing. But what I'm really hoping to do is make this a, an interactive session where I can answer your questions. I've always found it's a lot more interesting to be talking about what you want to hear rather than what I think you want to hear. So just to kind of set the stage, give you a brief background, um, I'm a serial entrepreneur, got started in business uh, in the travel industry and built up several companies in the Washington DC area. But in kind of about the uh, early 90s, discovered the internet and the leverage that that could provide in growing companies. Um, so started investing in early stage companies around the Washington DC area and really found that I had a passion for early stage investing. Um, I'm much more enamored of the getting started part and putting a team together and coming up with an idea and trying to see it take birth. Um, I enjoy doing that more than kind of the day-to-day -day management. Uh, in the late 90s, a friend and I um, decided that there was a lot of activity around the Washington DC area and that we might benefit by aggregating some angels together where we could share due diligence and share deal flow and hopefully um, benefit from kind of group thinking. So we formed a thing called the Dinner Club. Um, and this was a organization of angel investors that met monthly and invited entrepreneurs in to present to the club and um, then we would make investments. And so much of what I'm gonna talk about this morning has to do with the experience that I've gained really over the last 15 years doing angel investing both individually and as part of one of these groups that we organized. So I'm gonna make this pretty simple starting off, just do the basic kind of you know when, where, how, um, and then open it up to your questions. I think one of the most important things that you can be thinking about as angels is when is the right time to be seeking funding. Um, I've had some interesting discussions with a few of you in the halls uh, yesterday, and I think one of the topics that just, you know, is on the front of everyone's mind is when do I look for money and how much money? And I think those are very important questions. Um, I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I've talked to who um, came in to me with a you know, three inch stack of business plan and they hadn't really yet answered the question, how much money do I need? Do I need money? Um, you know, proof of concept is something that we as investors are always looking for. We want to know that there's a there there, that you've really figured out what is the business that you're going to be in, how far you're going to take it. And um, one of the most difficult things you can do as an entrepreneur is seek funding before you really know what it is that you're looking for the funding to do. So my first tip for you, um, anybody taking notes, is be sure that you know when to seek funding. Once you've decided when, you need to know where. And I think finding angels is easier than many of you might suspect. Um, I understand that in the Middle East, it's a little bit different. Uh, in the United States, angel funding is very popular. It's uh, quite common for an entrepreneur to do an early stage round with their friends and family, get the company started, and then go out and seek angel financing. Uh, I understand in the Middle East that that's somewhat different, but I would suspect that the avenues for seeking angels are very similar here. Um, if I were going about this, the first place I would look is the professional community. The lawyers, the accountants, um, the investment bankers. Um, you know, someone who's an investment banker isn't going to finance your deal, but they know investors who may. Um, the lawyer isn't necessarily going to be the lawyer you hire to work with, but he has a network of people that he represents, uh, other deals that he's been involved in, and he can point you to angel investors. Same with accountants. Anybody got an idea what the single best source for finding angel investors is? Any thoughts, guesses? Yes. 
Friends and family would be an excellent place to start. I'm really thinking about the next round beyond that. Yes. Excellent idea. He said looking at your competition, where they got their funding from. Very good point. How about other entrepreneurs? Other entrepreneurs that you're aware of that have been recently funded. They've been out on that path. They've probably made presentations to a dozen, two dozen potential sources. And maybe those sources didn't want to fund that specific deal, but they were people that were interested enough to have talked to that entrepreneur. They might be interested in funding your deal. So I think that's the number one source. So once you've kind of located some people to talk about, you've got to have a pitch. I'm sure you've all heard uh, the phrase, the elevator speech, uh, the concept that if you got on an elevator with someone, by the time you get to the fourth or fifth floor, you have to be able to have told them what your idea is very succinctly. Um, I do think it's important to have a pitch. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be one that you can recite in 30 seconds, but I would suggest that it be clear um, and short um, and understandable. You know, one of the things that turns off investors more than anything else is when someone starts talking about something that I don't understand. You need to get it into layman's terms, into terms that the investor can understand. And even if you're into, you know, nanotechnology, I don't want to really know about the technology. I'm probably not going to understand that. But I do want to know about your market. I want to know about how you're going to build a team. And I want to know how you're going to be successful and make both of us money. Those are things I can talk to you about and I can understand. So the suggestion here is keep it simple, keep it direct, keep it short. Several people have asked me um, in the last couple of days about business plans and the pros and cons of an executive summary, a lengthy plan. Um, I think we all have our own personal biases about this, but um, I'm an advocate of short. Um, I don't know very many investors who are willing to read a 30 or 40 page document. Um, maybe 10 years ago, we were doing that, but deal flow has increased. Um, in an average month, uh, at the height of the bubble in the US, which was 10 years ago, I was probably seeing 30 to 40 business plans a month. And most of them were pretty good. But I didn't have time to read 30 or 40 pages times 30 or 40 business plans. Um, so I'd look at an executive summary, a one or two pager. If I can't understand it in one or two pages, it's probably too complicated for me. Now I know all of you spend a lot of time working on the full business plan, and I'm not suggesting you don't do that. I think it's a terrific exercise to organize your own thinking. I think you should write a business plan, and it should be a very comprehensive plan. But I don't think that's a sales tool. I think it's an organizational tool for you. The sales tool is you. As an investor, I'm going to invest in you and your team. So when you come into my office to pitch me, I don't really care if you've got the world's greatest business plan. I want to know about the passion that you have. I want to know about the market. I want to know about why you're going to be successful when some other people may have tried something similar and not had success. So you have to differentiate yourself. And people do that in a variety of ways, but I think you should be yourself. You know, some people have asked me, do I need to come in and tell a joke? Or do I need to talk about the competition? Or should I stand up when I present to you? And you know, those are all good questions, but my answer is always the same, and that is be yourself. If I'm ultimately gonna invest in you, I wanna invest in you, how you really are, not how you're there just presenting to me that morning. So we're gonna be long-term partners. I need to get you to know you as an individual. So be yourself, be short, be convincing. Now let me talk about the flip side of that for just a minute. Um, I think finding the right angel investor is very important. And you know, this is something that I've, I've said to a lot of entrepreneurs and they all kind of nod their heads, but I can see them thinking, well, that's easy for him to say. Um, there's a tendency to want to invest with anybody that will invest with you, <laughs> to want to partner with anybody that's willing to write a check. And for many of you that go out seeking angel investing, you're gonna talk to a dozen people maybe before you even get someone that's vaguely interested in your project. And when that first person gets jump up and down excited about it and is willing to write you a check, it's hard to back off and say, well, let me consider this. You know, are you the right partner for me? But I think it is absolutely key to your success. I know a lot of deals that have um, 
headed south, been unsuccessful because the partnership was not the right partnership. That investor has to have uh, an alignment with you. That could be the amount of time they expect to be in the deal, the amount of money it's going to take, even an interest in the subject matter. But if you find someone who's looking for a quick flip, they're going to invest and hope to sell the company in a year, and your plan is to build a company over five years, there's going to be conflict right from the beginning and tension. So as hard as it sounds, um, I think you should be shopping for the investor the same way that we as investors are shopping for companies. Um, the hardest thing to do is to say no to the first person that offers you a check because that's what you've been out looking for and it's exciting. Someone has now said, hey, I like my idea. Very hard to say no to that. But the best circumstance you can have is two or three competing offers to be funding your idea. And then you can truly choose between the people that are more appropriate. Um, I'm sure you've all heard a lot about due diligence. Um, once someone does get serious about your company and making an investment, they're going to want to do some serious due diligence. And this is a time where you have to be ultra cooperative. Um, this is a time where they really get to see if there's some, some substance there to you and your idea. And so the easier you can make that, the quicker this is going to go and the more likely it's going to end in a positive result. If someone starts their due diligence and they're turning up questions you can't answer, it's going to be a roadblock. And they're going to have an expectation that their questions should be easily answered by you and that you should even suggest some things they might want to look into. I'm always impressed when the entrepreneur invites me to do kind of pre-due diligence as part of their pitch, if they say, hey, come on out and meet my team, or I want you to come down to the factory and see what we're doing, or I want you to talk to some of our customers. If the entrepreneur is saying that up front, it shows to me that they're comfortable with their product, that they have confidence in what they're doing. If I have to initiate that conversation and start saying, well, who are your three biggest customers, or who are your two key employees, and you're kind of, well, we haven't done that yet, or I'm not sure who I want you to talk to, that kind of hesitation is a killer. So prepare for the due diligence that you know has to come. Now on the flip side of that, I think you need to be able to do due diligence on your investors as well. Going back to choosing the right partner, you should be armed with questions to ask that potential investor. What other companies have you invested in? How long were you in the deal? What kind of exit did you achieve? Was the entrepreneur happy with you as an investor? Would he take your investment again? You know, those can be hard questions, but they're very telling. If there's going to be a true partnership, you have to have a comfort level going both ways. So let me just wrap up with the introductory comments by talking about terms briefly. Um, it's something that gets glossed over. But I hope each of you will be thinking about questions to ask because we're going to open it up to questions here in just a minute. Um, I think you may have heard a couple of other speakers yesterday talk about the importance of terms and the timing um, as to when you get to negotiation and what the expectations are. Um, so many entrepreneurs, in my experience, get fixated on a number. They say, my company is worth X. And they don't think about the terms. They just have a pre-money valuation. They, they start shopping. They say, I'm looking to raise a million dollars at a $2 million pre-money valuation. That means after they raise a million dollars, it'll be worth $3 million. Um, and they get that number fixed in their mind before they've even talked to investors who have started to give them feedback about what the investor thinks the company might be worth. Now, the opposite end of the spectrum can be true, too. I've, I've had people walk into my office, and when I say, how much money are you raising, they kind of shrug and say, well, we're not sure. Um, that's always perplexing to me. I think you should have a good idea of how much money you're looking for and how that money is going to be spent. But it has to be coupled with the terms that you're willing to accept. So what I mean by terms is, is it common stock? Is it preferred stock? Is it a loan? Um, there's some kind of first level simple differences. And then there are secondary and tertiary levels that get much more complicated in terms of who gets paid out first in an exit, what kind of return is guaranteed, 
And those are things that you're probably going to need help from advisors, possibly your lawyer, or an advisory board that you may have put together. But um, as you've probably heard others say, the terms are much more important than the actual dollar figure or the valuation. If I had to pick one amount of money or terms, I'd always pick the terms. So let me pause there. I'm happy to talk about some other things, but I just want to open it up to questions and see what you all are curious about. So I think we've got some microphones out in the audience, but if somebody would just raise their hand if they have a question, and we'll go from there. Either? It's right there. Um, how much percentage a company, a startup company, should give an angel investor initially? Okay, could everybody hear that question? What kind of percentage would you give away with a first round of investment? Um, I think it's a great question. It's one that um, I hear often and I think about often. And I don't have a perfect answer for you. Um, but again, it comes back to kind of comfort. Um, and I think you have to look beyond that first round. Um, if I was pressed to give an average, I would say any round of financing, you're probably giving up 25 to 30 percent of the company. So in a first round, if you took in X dollars, you might expect to give up 20 to 30 percent. Um, the bigger question is, are you raising the right amount of money? If you raise too little and you go out for that second round, you're going to give up another big chunk. So you need to make sure you're raising enough money in the first round that you're comfortable giving up 20, 25, 30 percent. Now, it is a negotiation. The angel may come in and be asking for a larger percentage than you're willing to give up. It doesn't mean that you can't get a deal done. Um, most investors are pretty flexible. But, but you need to have an expectation, be in the ballpark. Um, if you go out and, and have a very high idea of the valuation of your company, and you're trying to raise a significant amount of money, and you're only willing to give up 5 or 10%, people aren't going to be interested. It's too little. They need to feel there's a significant stake for their investment to be meaningful for them. So if you give up a third in the first round, let's say you go down the road and you spend a year or two years and you go through that money and you need to do a second round, you're probably going to give up a third again. That doesn't mean a total of two thirds, a third of whatever the company's worth at that point. So founders do get diluted. Many companies go through multiple rounds. But as you may have heard Jim Hornthal say yesterday, you know, he'd rather have a, a small slice of something big than a big slice of something small. And I think that uh, that's the right idea. Here, back there, either way. Let's get to you. Uh, hi, my, my name is Mark Bradley. Um, Good morning. Originally from Australia, now living in, in Abu Dhabi. I operated a pre-seed seed, a very small pre-seed seed fund in Australia for a few years and because of the difficulty in valuing small startup companies at that level, we used the instruments of convertible notes. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested in your comment because I've been trying to find out uh, amongst people at this conference who are in this game how you would do that in this part of the world uh, because convertible notes usually have an interest rate component, a penalty clause in them, mm -hmm. um, and that wouldn't be necessarily be acceptable in this environment. So I'd be interested in, 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 in anyone in the, also in this environment who has come up with a way of doing this that's Sharia compliant. And so any comments on this would be, be most appreciated. Sure. Um, first of all, let me just say that in the U.S., convertible notes are a very common approach to funding. By what he means by convertible note is someone says, I'm going to essentially loan you, call it a million dollars and it may have an interest rate attached to it, but when a subsequent round is done, that note may convert into stock at a price to be determined later on. So that is a, a very common approach. But I have a friend in the audience that may know more about this. Alfie, can you comment on the Sharia compliant issues? Take the microphone there. Go ahead. I, I think if you can do a pick, which is a paying kind, and you get more shares and a slightly better valuation rather than interest, so that you don't couch it as interest, that you can tweak it to be Sharia compliant, if you have Sharia compliant investors. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's precedent for it here. I mean, in, 
I personally am not very concerned about the, the Sharia compliant component of it uh, and negotiate you know, an interest rate or some discount. And the discount, you get a 50% discount, it gets bigger the longer it takes to get the next round. Alfie, can you just briefly tell them your background so they understand? To put you on well, the spot? I'm speaking after you, so I'll, I'll give my background when I come up. Okay, Alfie's a very sophisticated local investor based in Cairo. Yes. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, Cal, when, when uh, you write a book, you typically go to find a literary agent who then negotiates and advises you on a structure with the publisher who is in the context of angel investing, I guess, the investor. Um, for somebody who's starting a business, typically you go to the source of money, whether it's a professional investor or a, a group of friends or whatever. Um, I sort of feel that there is a, a sort of need for most people to have an advisor to help them structure something. You say mm -hmm. you have a fantastic deal flow, and I'm sure it's true. I think, I think doctors and investors get more paperwork than anybody else on the planet. And so you would prefer, I imagine, to have a well-structured, thought-through proposition uh, in an executive summary backed up with, a, say, a 30-page plan, which you could look at and just look at the first four pages or mm -hmm. the numbers or whatever. How does uh, somebody find the right person to be the equivalent of the literary agent, to use my analogy? Great question. Thank you. Did everybody understand the question? I, I think, broadly speaking, he, he's talking about where do you find advice? Many of you as early stage entrepreneurs probably haven't raised money before. And so how do you find advice both about how to uh, create that executive summary that concisely says what you're doing, but also what to expect in terms of what percentage of the company you're giving up, how you should price it, what the terms might be. Um, I think first of all, coming to conferences like this and, and learning from other entrepreneurs is, is a great way to do that. Um, but I certainly think there's a role for professional advisors as well. Uh, there are many lawyers around the world that um, specialize in transactions and have had experience um, and probably experience in that region of the world. Um, if you came to me, I'd be happy to tell you about you know, how to structure a deal in Washington, D.C. But if you were trying to structure a deal in Cairo, you'd be better served to go to someone like Alfie. Um, so I do think local knowledge is important. But I think broadly speaking, a lot of deals all over the world have the same issues. There's a question of valuation. There's a question of timing. How long do you expect to be in the deal? There's a question of uh, management and oversight. So what rights does the investor have? What rights do you as the entrepreneur maintain? And that control issue is something that usually is um, well debated during the process of, of raising money. Um, the point you made originally, though, I think is a very good one, which is, yes, as an investor, I'd much rather have you come into that first meeting with a request. If someone comes in to me and says, look, I'm trying to raise a million dollars for 25% of the company, we're going to do X, Y, Z across the next two years, then we expect to have a second round, but that second round is going to be at a $6 million valuation, and then we're going to do X, Y, Z, and we expect to exit the company in four years. Then I kind of know what I'm looking at as at least a beginning point. Now, as I get into it with my due diligence, I may discover that I feel it's going to take longer than that, or it's going to take more money than that. But at least it's important to me to know that there's a starting place, that you as the entrepreneur have an expectation of how much you're raising and what you're going to do with it, and what you're willing to give up for that. So I think the advisory piece of it, other entrepreneurs, professionals, conferences. Yes. Is there a button on there? Okay. I'm actually just responding to the question that was asked earlier about Sharia compliant convertible notes. I can uh, explain those to you offline later on, but there are mechanisms in this region to do that. Um, primarily, you could have a sale buyback of the underlying corpus of assets or shares at a predetermined markup. And basically, it's a synthetic interest instrument, but it's Sharia compliant. So I can talk to you about it later on. Great. Thank you very much. I think there is one back there and run here. Well, you can go ahead. You've got the mic. Go ahead. 
Um, I've got a question. When you, when you invest into companies that are run by, let's say, young entrepreneurs, some of them are maybe straight out of university, they're very passionate about what they do, but the last thing they've got on their mind is to look at international accounting standards, board meetings, minutes of board meetings. They probably haven't even heard of that. So what's your take on corporate governance on the small, young companies, um, and how do you deal with that? That's a great question. Um, I guess I hope that their youthful enthusiasm will make up for the shortcomings in the other areas. Um, you know, I, I have invested in some very young entrepreneurs that, that hadn't even finished school and, and came up with an idea and left school to pursue that idea. And, and that enthusiasm, that passion, that drive can get you a long ways. But I think as entrepreneurs, um, it's important that they realize what they don't know. And a good partnership can, can be an opportunity there if they find the right angel investor who can bring some of that experience in terms of corporate governance and structure and suggest the right arrangement, then let the entrepreneur run off and be passionate about building the business and let the investor help take some of that corporate governance load. Cal, my if, if you don't have cooperation in that, it can be a huge problem. Um, I have a very good friend whose uh, son was brilliant, absolutely off the charts brilliant. And, and came up with a software program, but he didn't want to listen to what anybody thought it should be worth, because he was brilliant. <laughs> and so he kind of felt he knew what he was doing. And he was a great software engineer, but he couldn't raise money because he had unrealistic expectations of what people would pay for that initially. And ultimately, he came around to understanding that there had to be a partnership between the investor and the entrepreneur, and he raised money at a reasonable level and ended up being very successful with it. But it is a partnership. Cal, continuing on what you've been talking about here, you've done a wonderful job of outlining what it means to be an angel right up to the day the deal is signed. Can you talk a little bit more about the day after? And you were an entrepreneur, you had angels. If you're the angel that you seek, what does that mean on the going forward basis once a deal is done? Great question, thank you. Um, I think part of what I was mentioning earlier about choosing the right partner is a big part of what, what you're mentioning there. Um, you know, the typical investment uh, does run for longer than most of us expect going in. And so you're going to be partners with that source of funding for probably several years. Um, the best angels are the ones that have a clear value to bring to the equation beyond the checkbook. Um, now, that, that can vary widely. It might be someone who has a great network and can help you with hiring a CFO. It might be someone who has experience in developing sales channels. It could be someone who really knows about growing a company rapidly. But most angel investors do have broad business experience. And so choosing someone that can help you not only write that initial check, but to build your company going forward is very important. The conflict sometimes comes when the angel gets too involved. They're in there looking over the shoulder of the entrepreneur every day. Um, it's quite often a scenario where the investor says, hey, I'm going to write you a check. I'd like quarterly updates, but you go run the company. And then, you know, a week later, they're calling up saying, what were sales? <laughs> um, you know, that can get old quick. And so, again, in doing your own due diligence, I would want to talk to other entrepreneurs that have had that investor be a partner with them. A great angel is involved to the degree you want them involved and is bringing value beyond the checkbook. But a bad angel investor can be someone who thinks he can come in and run the company better than you can. So I just think there has to be a balance. Look over here. While the mic's coming over there, let me, let me just talk about exits briefly for a moment because I think it's something that very few of us think about going in but is an important part of the equation. Um, as an investor, I want to know what your expectation is for an exit. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, am I going to grow the company and it's going to be hugely successful? Uh, I want to know what you personally are looking to get out of this. Is this a lifestyle company that you're building that you just want to have a job and have a team and be doing something you like and you're not that concerned about growth or profits? Or at the other end of the spectrum, is this something that you expect you're going to build in two years and take it public and, and become, you know, hugely rich? Um, one's not necessarily better than the other, but you need alignment. And um, as an investor, 
one of the very first questions I ask of the entrepreneur is, how do I get out of this? Um, you know, there's two things that I think about in a deal. How much money can I make if things go well? How much money can I lose if things don't go well? And different investors will put themselves on different parts of that spectrum. Some have a tolerance for losing the whole thing. They're willing to roll the dice. They write the check. They hope the company works out. But if it doesn't, they've lost their money. Some angel investors want to only invest in going concerns that have an underlying asset. If it can't be grown, that's OK, as long as when the company is sold, there's still some remainder that may get all or part of my money back out. So again, there has to be alignment. You need to know what the expectation is there. Yes. Thanks. Hey, I'm an occasional uh, business angel, and I've met um, several cases in my life. And, and the cases where things go wrong is what uh, interests me in your reaction today. Because more often things go wrong or are unpredictable. And one of the cases that's not easy to manage is when you realize that the idea is good, the founder, the creator is a good guy, but he's simply not up to the task of running the show, bringing it to step two. He's a big investor, he's a big shareholder. How do you get rid of him in a positive, constructive, friendly way so that you don't break the company, he stays an investor, and you bring somebody good on the side? to run the show? It's a great question. You sound like you've had experience with this. <laughs> a couple. <laughs> a couple. Um, the, the point he's making is an excellent one. Um, and as entrepreneurs, it's something that you all should be thinking about. Um, it goes back part to your earlier question of how much of the company you give up. If you raise a round and you only give up 10 or 20 percent, then no matter how hard that investor yells, you can say, look, I'm trying to listen to you, I'm trying to work with you, but I own 80% of the company, we're going to do it my way. If as you go along down that path, you take in a second and a third round, it's not unusual that the, invest, the original team, the founder, gets to be less than 50% ownership. And as Jim Hornthal mentioned yesterday, that can still work out terrifically for the founder. But along the way, the founder is going to lose some of that control. Um, now, when things are going well and you have an enlightened founder and enlightened investors, they can usually cooperate and work as a team. But sometimes, as you point out, there's a divergence. The founder feels the company should go one way, the investors have now decided it should go another way. What do you do? It's a tough, tough question. And, and basically, you try to work it out. But if you can't work it out, there's a reason there are things called voting rights. And ultimately, the control of the company is going to make that decision. And in some cases, the best decision may be to replace the founder. Uh, it's, it's rarely a popular decision, but sometimes it's the right decision. So as entrepreneurs, remember you're still going to own some significant piece of the company, and you want the company to be successful. You may need to give up that role down the road. I don't think any of us go into the deal expecting that. But it's a great question. It's reality. It can happen. So you need to be prepared for that. How are we doing? Anything else over there? I think we got one in the back. Hi. How do you know when to take your company to the next level? Like, for example, with us, I mean, we're, we started with one store t nearly 10 years ago. Now we're 14 stores across the region. We wholly own the stores. Uh, we've self-funded our uh, company, you know, basically through our profits, so we're, you know, we're debt-free, we don't have any partners or angel or investors or so forth. But at the same time, we franchise a couple of stores which are very, very successful, and, but now it's, it's reached a point where uh, a year ago we had one, you know, big retail giant that wanted to acquire the company, you know, and we thought, hmm, you know, well, maybe, do we want to go that route, but then you lose control of what you have built, basically. Or do you want to continue with the franchise route, which is, you know, you have more control on the systems, the procedures, and the quality, and so forth. But again, uh, you'll then have to deal with more franchisees, you know, then, it, or is it the fact that you should look at being acquired, where then a company comes in, which is, you know, a very, very big company, and then they basically run with it and duplicate it across the region. I mean, what would you, uh, your advice be? Well, you're asking an important question, and I think it goes to my earlier comment about thinking through what does the future look like. 
um, right from the beginning. And very few entrepreneurs have a plan that goes from A to B in a straight line. You know, it's much more often a zigzag. Uh, I have a friend that's a venture capitalist that said to me, I've never seen a business plan yet that was executed. Things change. And quite often the companies change with that. Um, but I do think it's good to have a plan going in. Most companies get to a point where they have choices. Um, in your example, I think the idea of, you know, are you acquired or do you franchise is an important consideration. And what I would suggest is that most entrepreneurs can benefit from having an advisory board right from the very beginning. Sometimes when you're just starting and there's, you know, just you working out of your basement, it seems a little silly to have an advisory board. But experienced entrepreneurs, people that have been down this path before, can help you plan for those eventualities. If you wait till you have a, a situation like you're talking about, and then you say, gee, I need some advice, and you go out and you put together an advisory board, they haven't benefited from the history of how you made prior decisions, how you grew the company. So my recommendation would be create an advisory board early so that as you get to that inflection point, they've already participated in the decision making and they can help advise you on that important decision. Now, I, I will just give you know, one side note here from personal experience. I, I'm involved with a franchise company that has had explosive growth in the United States. Um, but what they've discovered is that their corporate owned stores are much easier for them to manage than their franchise stores. That the franchisees call up and have questions and want to do it a different way. And with their corporate owned stores, they just tell the team to go do it their way. And their corporate owned stores, on average, make a much higher margin than the franchise stores. So the owners of this concept have stopped franchising largely and have said, we're going to just take the capital and build corporate owned stores. Now, they started off with a franchising concept because that was the only way they could raise money. Franchising essentially is just a financial vehicle. It's another way of raising growth capital. But you do give up a lot of operating control of those units. So it's a difficult question. Yes? Hi. My question would be on the advisory board. Uh, generally, if it's a startup, you would want really great brains in your advisory board. How do you pay them and what, what do you think are your experiences on startups setting up an advisory board? Great, don't know if everybody could hear that. He's talking about if you're creating an advisory board early, how do you compensate those people for that? Um, you're probably very thin on capital at this point. Um, there's a variety of ways. Some advisors expect to be paid fees. Some expect to have a share of the company. So many founders, when they're organizing the fundraising, they may carve off, you know, 5% for an advisory board. And then they can give, you know, four or five people one point each. Um, there are many advisors that are willing to start with an early stage company for free. They're looking for the experience. Um, they want to know more about the field that you're developing. Maybe it's a potential strategic partner for a business that they're engaged in. Uh, or maybe it's just friends or mentors. Um, Personally, uh, I feel that if an advisor is spending the time, they should be compensated. Now, maybe not right off the bat, but soon. Uh, and I think an advisory board well chosen and well listened to, which is a sep separate conversation, um, can be very worth its, its money. Um, I say the most typical approach is a small sliver of ownership because then all your interests are aligned. Is there anybody else in the room that's had experience with advisory boards that would like to share with us a pro or con of that? Um, one thing that um, I, I want to make sure we cover is timing. Um, for a lot of you, I think the expectation is I'm going to launch this company and things are going to go terrific and two, three years down the road I'm going to be acquired or I'm going to take it public. Um, I'm here to tell you that doesn't happen very often. And most angel investors have had more experience with that than the entrepreneurs. So I'm just advising that you be willing to listen to your investors about planning for the rainy day, raising enough capital to get you down the path further than you expect, um, and be resilient. When plan A doesn't work, have a plan B ready to go. 
Um, we have a gentleman sitting in the, in the audience that I'll try to embarrass here. Um, you may have heard Jim Hornthal talk on a panel yesterday about angel investing. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to be one of the angel investors in one of Jim's early deals. And at the time, it sounded like a terrific opportunity. And so I happily wrote the check. And about a year down the road, Jim called up and said, well, you know, this hasn't quite worked out the way I thought it was, but we're going to change the business a little bit. We're going to raise a little bit more money, and we're going to go off this direction. And Jim's a very convincing guy, and so that sounded pretty good. And about a year later, we had a similar phone call, and he was going back over this direction. This went on for several years. But everybody that was an investor in that deal really believed in the entrepreneur's ability to ultimately be successful to get it done, whatever it turned out to be. <laughs> and for those of us that were involved, it was a longer road than any of us signed up for. But down the road, he was successful, and, and we all were rewarded handsomely. But that was a case where the entrepreneur communicated with his investors and had the support each time he did zig or zag because he'd been willing to communicate. And so everybody's interests were aligned. We were betting on an entrepreneur, Ultimately, the model that rewarded us was not the model we bet on initially, but the entrepreneur was the same. So I, I think that's a, a, a good story to end on. Um, I applaud all of your interests in being entrepreneurs. I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I don't know enough about the Middle East region, but I can tell you in the United States, entrepreneurial endeavors are alive and well. Much of the growth of our economy comes from entrepreneurs. And um, I think it's just a, a testimony to all of you that you're here today learning about this, and I wish you well for the rest of the conference. Thank you.